Indian Prime Minister is in Nepal on his third visit since assuming power. With visits to three temples in two days, it seems like religious symbolism is the flavor of this visit. Starting with the Janki Temple in the historic city of Janakpur, here's what happened today. At first glance, that would look like any other temple in India. But this is the Janki Temple in Nepal, and it's special in Hindu mythology because Janakpur is where Goddess Sita was born. Narendra Modi sought blessings at this temple, even mingled with the temple staff, and played a musical instrument sharing his enthusiasm with those present there. Just minutes before that, a red carpet reception welcomed the Indian Prime Minister at the Janakpur airport with the country's Defence Minister in tow. Clad in a traditional pink turban, Narendra Modi then left for the Janki Temple, sending a very clear message, that of religious diplomacy. The auspicious beginning was followed by a significant announcement. Narendra Modi, along with his Nepalese counterpart, inaugurated the Ramayana circuit bus route that would join Janakpur to Ayodhya, the birthplace of Sita's husband, Lord Ram, in India. Today, Janakpur, Ayodhya, Sidi bus seva ka praram ho raha hai. Mai iske liye bhi Adhaniya Pradhan Mantri ji ka prashasan ka pradai se abhaar vyakta karta hoon. Aur bhavish mein aarthik vikas ke liye humare sanskrutik samandho ko aur taakat dene ke liye humare people to people contact ke liye ये एक नई दरोहर के रूप में आगे रास्ता प्रशस्त करेंगे। Emphasizing on India's neighbors first policy, Narendra Modi highlighted the strength of Indo-Nepal ties. Soft diplomacy done. Now it was time for business. Prime Minister Modi flew to Kathmandu, where he held bilateral talks with the Nepal Prime Minister K P Sharma Oli. The two Prime Ministers held bilateral talks in Kathmandu and discussed a new roadmap in bolstering India-Nepal relationship, agreements on energy, agriculture, education and other memorandum of understandings were also signed to enhance people-to-people -people linkages and promote economic growth between the two neighbours. The biggest highlight was the inauguration of the 900 megawatt Arun 3 project which is being constructed in Nepal with India's assistance. This is the Indian Prime Minister's third visit to Nepal within a period of three years. It shows India's commitment to the neighbourhood first policy and Modi's tactfulness in handling foreign policy, especially in the backdrop of China's growing links with Nepal. Bureau Report, we on. Now, we can't stress enough on the importance of the temple visits on Mr. Modi's visit to Nepal. The Janki Temple, the Muktinath Temple and the Pashupati Nath Temple. India seems to be walking the faith diplomacy route to bolster its ties with Nepal. A revival of historical and cultural ties is part of this effort. Modi's visit, which began in Janakpur, is expected to speed up work on the Ramayan circuit. The route comprises 15 places that are associated with the Hindu god Ram. The 2,000 crore rupee project was started in 2015 by India's central government. The plan is to ease connectivity, provide accommodation for tourists and boost local economies. One phase of this circuit is from Ayodhya in the Indian state of Uttar Pradesh, where uh, Lord Ram is believed to have been born, to Janakpur, where his wife Sita is believed to have been born. Remember, Janakpur is on the Nepal border at a distance of about 500 kilometers from Ayodhya. Other places on the Ramayan circuit are Chitrakoot and uh, Shiringverpur in Uttar Pradesh, Sita Mari, Baksar and Darbhanga in Bihar, Mahendragiri in Ud Odisha, Jagdalpur in Chhattisgarh, Bhadrachal in uh, Bhadrachalam, pardon me, in Telangana, Rameshwaram in Tamil Nadu, Hampi in Karnataka, and Nasik in Nagpur in Maharashtra. This visit is more than a mere diplomatic venture. The underlying message in it is the use of faith to strengthen ties rather than resorting to just conventional methods. 
It's believed that mixing personal faith with bilateral diplomacy makes for good optics. And if all goes well, then this visit uh, could turn out to be just that. It also provides an alternative to bring back normalcy to the ties between the neighbours, especially in the backdrop of Beijing strengthening its political and economic ties with the Himalayan nation. Faith diplomacy is seen seeping into India's foreign policy on multiple fronts, not just with Hinduism. The Indian administration is also using Buddhism to get an unparalleled advantage in tapping into its neighbours. Similar to the Ramayana circuit, India's tourism ministry is also working on a Buddhist circuit. The project that was started in 2015 hopes to link Kapilavastu and Lumbini in Nepal, where Buddha was born, to Bodh Gaya in Bihar, where Gautam Buddha is said to have attained enlightenment. For months now, there have been murmurs about where the all-important Trump-Kim meeting will take place. The United States President has put all that speculation to rest, though. On Thursday, he confirmed the date and venue of the meeting. But at 2 o'clock in the morning, I had the incredible honor of greeting three brave Americans who had been held in North Korea, and we welcomed them back home the proper way. And on June 12th, in Singapore, I'll be meeting with Kim Jong-un to pursue a future of peace and security for the world, for the whole world. And the relationship is good. But you remember everybody in the fake news where they were saying, He's going to get us into a nuclear war. He's going to get us into a nuclear war. And you know what gets you into nuclear wars? And you know what gets you into other wars? Weakness. Weakness. So the relationship is good, and hopefully, I mean, for all of us, for the world, hopefully, something very good is going to happen. And they understand it's very important for them. It's important for everybody. So the location for the Kim-Trump meeting has been finalized. Uh, the president, they're talking about it. Uh, it's not happening in Mongolia or the DMZ or Switzerland even. All of them were considered options at one point. It is Singapore that has been picked for this historic summit between the two leaders. The White House has confirmed that the U.S. president, uh, or rather the United States, will continue to push for permanent denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. The city-state of Singapore is diplomatically neutral, it's highly secure and well-practiced at pulling off sensitive events. In fact, the first meeting between China and Taiwan also took place in Singapore. It has tight restrictions over the media and public gatherings, which will allow for a controlled environment, which uh, will be preferred by the North Koreans. Singapore is also in the rare position of having friendly diplomatic ties with both Washington and Pyongyang. The Shangri-La Hotel, which hosts the annual high-level Shangri-La Security Dialogue, will be the likely venue for the summit. So here's how Singapore's residents are reacting ahead of the summit. Listen in. Singapore is a, a global hub, highly respected. Uh, it's a first world um, um, economy. It is um, at the crossroads of the East and West. Um, and therefore signifies progression and signifies uh, all things possible. Uh, as compared to a site like uh, Panmunjom in the DMZ, which was, I think, a close candidate, um, that would have been uh, a good site for its own reasons. But I think looking back now, uh, that's also a site that reminds people of all the past failures and historical bag baggage that comes along with this long-standing crisis. So Singapore really marks a fresh start, and it's neutral ground. I think it really gives some Singapore some uh, uh, prominent and uh, promising to other countries to see us as a peacemaker. Singapore has this big role to play in bringing together global peace. So a uh, small traffic jam is a very minor pay, a price to pay for it. 
On to Africa now, 11 new cases of Ebola fever, including one death, have been reported since Tuesday in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Two of those cases are confirmed to be Ebola lab results are pending on the other nine cases, which are also suspected to be of the virus. The disease, which most commonly affects people and non-human primates like monkeys, gorillas, bats and chimpanzees, is caused by one of five Ebola viruses. On average, about 50% of people who become ill with Ebola end up dying. Now the World Health Organization says it's preparing for the worst case scenario in an Ebola outbreak in a remote area of the DRC. This includes the potential for the virus to spread to a major town. The WHO also informed that there are three of these cases involving one death pertains to healthcare workers. It seemed that uh, the government is actively exploring the use of the vaccine and we're waiting for final authorization. I expect to receive that in the coming days. And in the meantime, we are preparing as if it will be a green light. So cold chain is on standby, the stockpile is on standby, the teams are being put on standby, including up to 40 people that conducted the initial ring vaccination trial in Guinea. So people with real experience from Guinea. You've known Russia's President Vladimir Putin as a strong man. His skills as an administrator are quite well known, but now you'll see him dodge and skate on the ice as he dons the red jersey and takes to playing ice hockey. The Russian president scored five goals in an exhibition match on Thursday in what's become an annual tradition given ample airtime on state television. Putin played on a Legends of Hockey team alongside big names of the past like Pavel Bure and Slava Fetisov. The opposition comprised amateur players plus a governor and a pro-Putin billionaire. Not surprisingly, Putin's team won the mostly slow-paced game 12-7. Five goals on the low side by Putin's standards. He scored eight in the 2015 game and seven last year. The 65-year-old Russian president took up hockey late in life after being a keen judo player in his youth. On the occasion, he praised the amateur league hockey players for setting a wonderful example for ordinary Russians. Said, quote, thanks to you, millions of people make a choice in favor of a healthy lifestyle, end quote. Over to China now, where uh, the country is building some brand new hotels. But what's new about that? China is known to... Uh, in, uh, increase its footprint in many areas but these so-called hotels are meant for pigs yes for pigs but why do pigs need hotels it's part of China's plans to modernize its farm sector and create wealth in the rural sector here's more this is a plan to take China's farm sector to a new high quite literally these pigs in southern China's Yaji mountain will be living in multi-storied buildings dubbed as pig hotels. As China pushes ahead with industrialization of the world's largest hog herd, part of a 30-year effort to modernize its farm sector, companies are experimenting with high-rise housing for pigs to protect the breed. The reasoning? Reduce the risk of pigs catching diseases by managing each floor like a separate farm. Staff work on the same floor every day and don't move throughout the building. On the one level farm, if you are keeping wean piglets and young female pigs with the sow, then there would be a lot of viruses in a place and it would be hard to raise pigs like that. However, as I said before, what we have here for the ventilation on every level of the building is special. The air doesn't go back, which means every level works like a traditional pig farm or a one-level pig farm. As I said, if I raise pigs on the seventh floor, they won't pose any threat to the pigs in the lower floors. This pig hotel in Yangxiang will have 30,000 sows compared with a more typical large one-level breeding farm of 10,000 pigs. If I put all the pigs in one place, which means we'll put all eggs in one basket, then it will become a bigger problem. Some private companies are pumping much more money into the new buildings, about 30% more than on their other farms. 
as big prices in China hover around an eight-year low and smaller firms halt expansions. The trend underlines the extent to which Chinese livestock producers can go to gain market share. As China forges ahead with rapid industrialization of the world's largest hog herd, high-rise housing is becoming a growing trend despite its high cost. Bureau Report, Vion. That aside though, more than 70,000 people in South China's Guangxi Zhuang Aut Autonomous Region have been affected by a heavy downpour. Rain started on a Monday have affected more than 70,000 people in 15 counties. More than 3,900 hectares of crop have been damaged and electricity has been disrupted several times, causing a direct economic loss of about 14.3 million US dollars. Several cities in the region, uh, including Yulin and Heizhou, are expecting more heavy downpours. In Yulin, firefighters rescued stranded residents from heavily flooded areas. Meanwhile, in the Luchuan County, rescuers saved an elderly, elderly resident who was trapped under the debris after a rainfall-triggered landslide caused a house to collapse altogether.